Um, good morning, everyone, uh, and thank you for joining us today. Uh, my name is Ivan Anderson, and I'm director of BDO's uh, FS Advisory Team, where I focus on prudential matter. Um, I'm joined here by my colleague, Dora Graham, who will present this morning on non-financial risks. Um, the first thing I want to say, I'm very grateful that so many of you have joined us. I think we actually more than 100 people uh, um, so far I can see um, attending uh, this morning, which is fantastic. And I think from all here at BDA, we just hope that you and your families and loved, loved, loved ones are well. Um, you know, we know that it's still quite a sort of a tough time out there. Uh, all the things look to be improving. Um, and I just want to say some housekeeping points before we start. So um, the first thing is today's webinar is going to be recorded. Uh, so we will circulate the slides, uh, you know, in a few days' time. So you, you know, you'll get those to sort of to take away. Um, and your lines during the presentation will be automatically muted. So there's no way for you to, you know, to talk, to talk or ask questions. However, please use the Q and A button uh, uh, to submit your questions through the panel, and we'll try to address them uh, um, uh, during uh, or after the the session. And just finally, um, before I hand over to Dora, I just want to make a brief comment around the importance of capturing and measuring non-financial risk. So we can just see from, I guess, under the current environment, how important it is uh, um, and how much focus it gets from regulators and other stakeholders, particularly areas such as ESG risk and operational risk. Uh, so I'll now hand over to Dora, uh, who will talk you through um, this morning's session. Thank you. Thanks, Ivan. Morning, everybody. Uh, as Ivan said, my name is Dora Grant. I also work in the Prudential team. Um, uh, the focus of the team I lead uh, is uh, about um, making sure that we bring, uh, amongst other things, that we bring seminars that uh, reflect your needs. Uh, that after we obviously see what regulators have to say, but also. Uh, the common themes that we see coming uh, in either in regulatory feedback or in work that we get and questions we have from our clients. Um, so if you do have any questions at the end, we will respond, but also it doesn't need to be today. If you are struggling or anything, you don't need to be our client. Just please do by all means get in touch. Um, in terms of what we'll cover today, uh, we will uh, talk about uh, how how the ICAP approaches or how non financial risks should be approached in the ICAP and the, uh, what you expect to be, uh, what we normally see. Uh, what is that we normally see that uh, brings a negative feedback from uh, in SHREP, uh, common pitfalls and, and things that normally uh, are uh, subject to that feedback. And then how to integrate uh, the so-called new risks in the ICAP. This is probably one of the questions that we also get the most lately. So we'll we'll approach that today as well. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so we start by the regulatory guidance. Um, there's plenty of regulatory guidance, but I think the, the essential one for the purpose of today's meeting is the first one on the left-hand side, the PRA's methodologies for setting pillar two capital. Um, Section four of the uh, of the of this guidance will uh, set out the requirements or the guidance for for uh, non financial risks. And in the context of section four, the PRA will actually allude to operational risk as conduct and non conduct risks. Make the distinction between the two. Uh, this chapter applies to systemic uh, relevant firms. However, the name. Uh, gives you a clue that the P this is a PRA's methodology, so somehow this will inform, this suggests that this will inform the way that the PRA will perceive the two uh, non-financial risks for firms. And uh, certainly over the last year, the vast majority of our clients will use this guidance or a hybrid version of it um, to estimate the two add-ons. Um, for non-conduct risk, the PRA will use three loss estimates to inform um, the setting uh, of a firm's pillar to A capital requirements, and those are C1, C2, and C3, if you assume that section four. First one is about forecasts of losses extrapolated to a one in 1,000 event. Uh, 
the the second one c2 is uh, the average of the firm's fir five largest losses uh, for each year uh, by basel event category and this alludes to the basel to uh, risk taxonomy which i'll speak to in a minute but this also uh, i should mention that this excludes uh, the category clients products and business practices which i'll talk a, a bit more in a minute uh, and the third one is the scenario approach. So it's the scenario assessments for a, for a one in 1,000 year confidence level. So as I said, uh, most of our clients will use a combination of these, but uh, in particular, the most used one would be C3, given that uh, the data that they have uh, uh, or the internal capacity they have would not be sufficiently developed to uh, drive the 2A calculations. However, I should note that uh, the above estimates are not alternatives, so they are cumulative, and all of them will inform uh, the PRA's judgment. On conduct risks, uh, they are different because they're even harder to quantify than uh, uh, non-conduct risks. Uh, so the vast uh, majority of the firms we uh, we, we see, uh, from who we see the ICAP, will use a different way uh, and they, they will assess it differently. Uh, the PRA does say that conduct risks should not be used, uh, should not be measured using predetermined distributions because it's really difficult to see the shape of the curve or to estimate the tail of the loss distribution. Uh, so the other thing that should be noted here is that uh, the proxy that the PRA uses for uh, conduct risks is the Basel category clients, products, and business practices that I have alluded to earlier on. Uh, we will discuss this a, li a little bit more in a minute, but this is one of the uh, normal uh, pitfalls we see is, the, is that the, the uh, link to this uh, risk category. So if you do have a taxonomy that doesn't uh, strictly align to the EBA taxonomy, that is absolutely fine. If the, the taxonomy should by all means reflect your risk profile, but do make sure that everything that is captured under the EBA taxonomy for the risk category, clients, products, and business practices will be captured in your ICAP to, to look at the risks. So the way the, overall, the way that the PRA will uh, set pillar two requirements is largely driven by um, four elements. One of them is how robust is the process of measuring um, pillar two a non-financial uh, risks, including the governance and challenge, probably that is as important as the actual number. How you compare with your peers. Um, most of our clients feel they're special, they're all special to me for sure, uh, but uh, the, the PRA will put you in a, a, a peer group and will somehow compare your uh, add-on to that peer group uh, to see whether you are far off or not. Uh, then how forward, how forward looking the process is and the ju that judgment normally that uh, the PRA will, will have will be driven by how the assessment links to the business plan. Uh, and that has, has that forward looking element and not looking only at things that have risks that have crystallized in the past. Because obviously the purpose of the ICAP is to look at the risks that you've got right now and you have in the next three to five years and whether you have enough capital to extend those risks. Uh, and then obviously their own judgment. Um, and it's impossible to say what whether your uh, estimate will prevail. But if normally if the, it is the likelihood of your, uh, your estimate be accepted is directly related with how good the the governance of the uh, challenge and the, and the challenge of the the pillar two A are. Um, not much to say about the CRR that you already don't know. Part three, title three, three will go through uh, the approaches. Um, you know that there will be uh, some changes uh, coming up. But do watch this space. This uh, we we're more focused on pillar two A today. Pillar two today. So we will come back to you with a different seminar later on uh, to uh, talk about uh, the standardized measurement approach or anything else that uh, can come that is different. I've added here the BA uh, because BA contains lots of important guidance that um, can help you to clarify the regulation. 
uh, Annex 2, for example, of the policy advice on the Basel III reforms for operational risk contains the EBA taxonomy I was talking about earlier, which is an evolution of Basel II, which has been around since for you know, 15 years now. But it, it's, quite, it's a lot clearer and what goes into each bucket. But also I added there uh, Annex 3, which is a helpful gu guidance for mapping the business indicator to FinREP, uh, which I hope that you find useful. Next slide, please. Okay, so capturing and assessing non-financial risks in the ICAP. We know that measuring uh, non-financial risks has been one of the main challenge uh, of our clients. Uh, I think what is to know is that it's a challenge for everyone. And the reason why it's a challenge is obviously because it's subjective. Uh, that's the, number, the reason number one uh, for, for being difficult. Um, typically, smaller firms do not have sufficient data. And in the majority of the cases, uh, this has to do with the fact that the risk assessment process is not uh, systematic yet. And the process of recording risk events uh, is not fully embedded. Uh, and this is not easy because uh, although the board may want to push it forward and hire resources to the second line of defense, uh, it will need the first line input to get traction. And uh, everything that relies on the first li line, it also linked to culture. So for example, if you think, if the first line still thinks that selling a product is more important than recording an event, uh, this will always be a difficult to get traction. Unfortunately, however, more often than not, uh, this will come through in the ICAP and it will be reflected on the regulator's assessment of the maturity of the operational risk uh, measurement process. And usually that ends up being a higher capital requirement anyway. Uh, so, but what I just said in terms of data, that the data collected in smaller firms is often incomplete and insufficient to drive capital um, that is an issue because obviously what what the, the difficulty is that sometimes they don't even have sufficient data to make it statistically significant that ends why they will uh, resource to obviously using c3 the, the scenario analysis so it's a lot a lot of it is based based on uh, subject matter experts in addition to that, even if, they were if there were sufficient data, what we are looking for in Pillar 2A uh, are the so-called tail risks. And that is those risks that occur in the language that is used in the PRI methodologies once every 1,000 years. And for those risks, even if you were to have that data, a big database, you wouldn't have data for those because it will always rely on subject matter expert to at least validate the shape of the curve. In firms who do not have a capital model, they will obviously have to uh, always res resort to subject matter expertise to confirm and calibrate that shape. Um, uh, it is hard to conceptualize one in 1000. And uh, it is even harder because nobody has experience. And this is, this is even harder for the first line, but it's a challenge that is, uh, that is applicable not only to small firms, but also to larger firms, hence the difficulty. Point number two has to do with the framework integration. In our experience, uh, firms do not always find easy to integrate financial and non-financial risks, and this usually also reflects uh, in the ICAP. Um, but it's important to say that this lack of integration is more visible actually in medium sized firms uh, where, so for example, what you see is that the person who does the ICAP and who challenges the ICAP is not the same person who will be doing the operational risk element on Pillar 2A. And so they come up with a new framework and you can see that there's a problem of integration there where, where different parts of the firm know different things. And that then actually reflects on the ICAP. It's sometimes not as visible in smaller firms where there are less people involved uh, in the ICAP. But the, obviously, the problem of integration is an issue given that uh, for ages uh, the focus has been in whatever 
hurts firms the most. And if the ICAP says that 80, 90% of their ICAP is credit risk or it is uh, any other risk, then what they will, uh, would, and that ends up happening is that almost of the resources will go to, um, to those risks. But it's, in, it's, it's a matter of approaching it uh, in a more efficient way. You can use exactly the same framework. And actually that's what's uh, desirable and uh, should be happening. So um, it, if you use the same framework, it's also cheaper and the, the control environment becomes um, also cheaper. Then uh, point number three is linked to point number two and is normally linked with the relatively uh, lower maturity of operational risk as a discipline uh, when compared to financial risks. This is more the case in banks and insurers, uh, with insurers typically calling financial risk potential risks, uh, but it's less so in investment firms, given that the majority, the largest risk in uh, investment firms will be operational risk. So in the case of banks and insurers, um, to a less extent in insurers, this is because historically they obviously have invested harder in, 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 in managing those financial risks, as I said earlier. Uh, and operational risks also came later in the day uh, as a result of, uh, and then result in a standalone framework. But uh, in saying this, uh, we know that most of the gigantic and monumental failures in history of financial services do arise from uh, non-financial risk events. In fact, the crisis that we are all living today uh, related with the COVID that obviously reflects into financial services is a non-financial uh, risk. And I do say to my clients that about 10 years ago, we all stopped uh, testing scenarios on uh, pandemics because we, you know, we thought that you know, everybody's expecting one day or nobody cares about that and there we are today. So uh, it is important that we, mo we note that it might not be the, the what keeps people's uh, mind busy, but it is what normally it drives. It's, it's the hidden risk sort of risk that that drives uh, failures. Although when I talk about operational risk as a discipline, what I mean is that operational risk is normally seen or is seen by some firms as just the operations or risk of going doing something wrong uh, in the operation side. But when we talk about operational risk as a discipline, we're talking about something that is a lot more encompassing and that includes things like data protection, information security, uh, ESG to some extent. Um, but in, in all fairness, there is a new concept, which I have been talking about today of non-financial risks is probably better and kind of does the trick. But uh, non-financial risks and operational risk, if you look at operational risk as a discipline, would be uh, it could be regarded as the same thing, and it is in some terms. And the last but not least uh, is, although we do say it, mo most of these issues that I've just described, they are known by boards. And, and that's the difference between, say, 10 years ago, is that it is, it, people, uh, management, senior management is pretty much aware that this is an issue. The issue obviously is, of course, that smaller firms have scarce, it is, the re resources are not available. Uh, we, they don't have big budgets to invest in very sophisticated uh, uh, non-financial risks uh, that just to feed in the ICAP and uh, because obviously the benefit is a cost benefit uh, analysis and they have to accept some risks uh, and it and, and, um, and it ends up being this one but that obviously reflects in in the way that the PRA perceives the PRA buffer on compared with Pillar 2B and the uh, Pillar 2A um, add-on. Next slide, please. So how do you go about adding uh, non-financial risks to the ICA? And I, I think what is important to say here is, is that most of the add-on that is different from anything that is not discretionary is comes from non-financial risks so it is in firm the firm's interest to make sure that they do the best they can to do to 
to be consistent in approaching non-financial risk. And this is because, of course, for the majority, for example, of smaller banks, what they have in the pillar 2A would be concentration risk and IRRBB. And those are formula uh, uh, driven. So there isn't much more that you can do right there. But obviously what will inform pillar 2A and the difference will be what comes under non-financial risks. Um, and I'm talking about banks in this case. Um, but you'll see that the integration issue is also visible in insurers and to a less extent investment firms, but it's also challenging for, uh, for investment firms to, to quantify uh, non-financial risks. And for them, it's even harder because obviously it's their main, main risk. So how do you go about it? So, well, first of all, identify emerging risks. This looks like really not you know, rocket science, but we, what we do normally see is that, depending on the maturity of the framework, people do will do look at their control environment to come up with the scenarios that they will test. That's for sure. The problem is that, in and it is probably sometimes it's even harder in larger firms where the process is so well embedded that they will look at what has been happening to date and what's happening in the past. So they look at events. Uh, which look at the past and they look at the, their RCSAs, which will, will tell you the risks right now. But what they forget to do is look at their business plan and look at what has been the difference in their business and in their ICAP in the last year. So it's important that you look at what are the risks that are emerging for you in uh, your business plan right now. And you look at those risks that are, that are key to your strategic objectives. Those are the risks that you should be considering whether you you have to have capital or not, because capital may not be the right mitigation. But it's the articulation of this uh, story uh, of this uh, this uh, issue that should be part of the ICAP, and that is as important as the actual number. Uh, the number has to be justified by something because it's so subjective. So the process of thinking is crucial in the ICAP. Also, do make sure that you distinguish and that you differentiate conduct and road conduct risks, as I said in the first slide. Uh, on section four, you'll have more guidance there on, of, of, on the PRI methodologies. But do make sure that you distinguish the risks as well. Sometimes what we see is that um, in smaller firms, it, this is not so much insurance companies because insurance companies do have normally very good conduct risk frameworks because obviously the PFCA is uh, on the case. In the case of banks, sometimes we find that uh, clients even struggle to identify what conduct is and you don't have to have a definition that is equal to your peer, but what you do need to do is explain what conduct means for you and ensure that how you link that to clients' products and business practices. Because clients' products and business practices, as the, the right name, as it says, it's not only about how people behave themselves while selling a product, but it's also about making sure that the products do meet the needs, that the services do meet the needs. So there's a lot of elements related to products and services. So think about your product governance framework and all that, and that will all link to this clients' products and business practices. So then the way you kind of explain the how your uh, model or how your definition will be different, that's really up to you. But as long as you make sure that you explain how that links to, to that risk category. Then align with the risk management framework, uh, you do need to make sure that your ICAP aligns with the overall risk management framework. And if your risk register or a top risk register or enterprise risk register is already linked to uh, the non-financial, to the business plan, then this, this job is pretty much done. But it is also important that you link your scenarios or the work you do under uh, non-financial risks to your taxonomy. The reason being is because obviously the taxonomy is, is the, the tool of a framework, that, or the tool that underpins the framework. So if, you, if the, if the the taxonomy does reflect what your key risks are, it will already reflect what your emerging risks are. And, and, and by linking that, this triangle will help you to demonstrate that. 
then decide the approach. Obviously, for pillar one, uh, for those on up on the basic indicator, everything that is less, uh, more sophisticated needs approval from the regulator. Uh, pillar two way uh, typically aligned with the PRA methodologies for setting a uh, pillar two capital. It doesn't have to be, uh, as long as you, you you know you justify. But what we normally see, certainly over the last year, is that all firms try at least one of those C3, C1, C3, C2, and C3, and do try uh, some scenario work. Uh, pillar 2B, we're not talking so much about Pillar 2B here today, but we also normally see that um, Pillar 2A tends to be, for non financialists tends to be seen in isolation. Uh, and that shouldn't be the case because if you have identified the two way uh, outlier risks, so one in 1000 years uh, risks, and they are the most severe thing that can happen for you uh, in non financial risks, then they perhaps you should consider whether they should be part of your pillar 2B. Uh, I, and, and when I say pillar 2B, I say of your stress testing. Should you be using it in your combined? Uh, stress testing to ensure that uh, it captures your um, your risk profile. So when you're looking at your stress testing exercise, you're thinking about what is it that collectively could affect me the most. And if you have said that pillar two, in pillar 2A, uh, that one of them would be, for example, cybercrime, then maybe it should be part of pillar 2B, but that depends on your risk profile and what is that your main risks are. But it is if you already have done the work for pillar two A, maybe you can use it for for the stress testing exercise as well. And sometimes we don't see that link. And then, last but not least, documenting the approach. As I was saying earlier, one of the most common negative feedbacks on the Shreps is that the methodology or the assumptions are not documented. So, for example, people do come up with uh, scenarios, but they don't justify why they chose those scenarios, and they don't justify how those align to the ICAA uh, 3.1 rule uh, and how those all link together. So, when something is not relevant for you, you need to justify why. It's not enough to say that the board thought about it and they felt they think that it's not relevant. You need to ex explain why, but also that you justify the challenge and what we normally see as well is that we do see challenge being uh, recorded for uh, financial risks but we see that the quality and the quantity of the challenge for non-financial risks is not as as uh, extensive or as uh, robust as it is for uh, financial risks so do if you have done five meetings with, with uh, management uh, just record them, append that to the ICAP as an, you know, add it as an appendix and to do make sure that you explicitly say what was the methodology and how that links to your risk management framework and to your business plan. Next slide, please. Okay, so common pitfalls. I've, I've spoken about a few now, but in terms of um, what we see, and hopefully that will help you as well, uh, again, senior manager not, not involved or challenge is minimal or not documented. Um, the importance of that, uh, the taxonomy is not truly understood. We still have, uh, and this is not embarrassing or anything, it's, it's, it's a fact uh, and it's okay, but there is not much reference to, to taxonomy uh, in smaller firms. So please do make sure that you understand this, the importance of this because the regulator does and the regulator approaches it. Uh, the ICAP is not aligned with the business plan. This is probably the most common um, uh, feedback we see on TREP is that they, the PRA has not, uh, the, the, the line between the, the alignment between the ICAP and the business plan isn't isn't clear, uh, methodology not aligned with the risk management framework or not aligned with the risk profile. Sometimes people do say, look, I've got four key risks uh, and these are X, Y, and Z. And then you don't see them in the ICAP. There is no justification as to why they are not in the ICAP. 
it could be that capital is not right, litigant, but that you need to explain in your ICAP why is that you're not setting capital aside because obviously the ICAP is how you firms will self-assess their capital needs and whether they remain solvent in um, normal situations but also in stressed situations. So it is essential that it reflects it's an output of, of your uh, risk profile. Uh, business not involved or fails to understand the, the understand the concept of ownership this is becoming less prevalent but it's still the case that uh, you know some of our first line uh, second line clients do struggle to to sell the concept of ownership and uh, or that's not really understood or they just do and do scenarios without involving the first line because they look at the library of scenarios but that the problem with that is okay it's probably could be consistent and sustainable for some time, but at some point you'll have different risks. And if you don't look ahead, you'll miss the risks that are uh, that are arising, that are emerging. Conduct and non-conduct risks are not segregated. We see this one very, very often. Um, sometimes the PRI will uh, mention, sometimes it won't, but it's equally important because it's in the guidance. Next slide, please. We spoke about this one, non-financial risks are siloed and the framework is not as mature as uh, non-financial risks. Uh, as I said, also, it's probably more evident in medium-sized firms that have actually a department that runs the ICAP and runs all the stress testing. But then obviously they're not particularly uh, privy to what non-financial risks are and vice versa. So there, there's that link missing sometimes. Um, this is the most, also the second most common feedback from the PRA, the approach does not effectively stress the firm. And typically that is when one in 1000 year threshold is not met or is not. So in other words, it's not stressing the firm. Or also, we also see uh, when firms do not uh, attribute a probability to the scenario, we see sometimes the feedback coming in. But not always, but this one is quite common that the one in 1000 year threshold is not met. The assumptions are not documented, the limitations of the methodology are not acknowledged. So I think that the approach is really this is what we've done. We know that it's subjective, but we think that this truly reflects our risk profile because X, Y, and Z. Normally, that's the best approach. Uh, so, likelihood of scenarios not assessed, I said it earlier and over reliance on insurance um as you know that uh, only uh, advanced measurement approach firms are allowed to use insurance um, pillar one we are talking about pillar two today but in any case we do see also people a lot of reliance on saying we wouldn't have this loss because we have an insurance uh uh here so and kind of that is the justification as to why there isn't uh a pillar to a add-on and that is fine to consider insurance but likewise uh, there are no insurances for everything and there are situations where a one in 1000 situation could be a situation where you forget you forgot to renew that your insurance next slide please uh, so how to integrate new risks i think the best way to do it and that's why i done the slide like this is to look at what's the regulatory agenda what is it that is concerning both the PRA and the FCA and um, these themes worry both the, the PRA and the FCA in different angles of it obviously the PRA the FCA more being related to how it affects your clients uh, your customers and you know you, the, how whether it causes the action for them or not but these four risks continue to be the most uh, important ones. And I think I put ESG separate because it is, uh, because uh, in operational resilience, outsourcing and business continuity are linked to one another. And ESG is, can be seen as a principal risk. So it may not be uh, a non-financial risk as such. Some firms will consider that. Um, Others won't, but in, es in essence, it comes from something external and to the company. So it's there on the side, but it's there because I know it's important for all of you. And we get lots of questions on ESG lately. Uh, 
uh, some of you will have attended our ESG seminar last uh, last month, uh, but I'll speak to that about that in a minute. Uh, operational resilience continues to be a priority. You need you do need to ensure that you define what operational resi resilience um, is for you if you haven't yet, and make sure that you what is that that you need to do in your framework to ensure that you demonstrate that you are resilient, but also that you link that to your financial resilience. Resilience in itself is probably the most critical uh, uh, concern of the, at least the PRA lately. So it is important that you also link that to your uh, uh, resolution plan and to your recovery plan and ensure that you have uh, all these things connected. Material outsourcing, we still see firms that do not successfully identify material uh, outsourcing providers uh, or have stepped up their due diligence process to address risks um, that are operational to their operational resilience and uh, how that, in fact, and they don't really assess how that would uh, impact their ability to treat customers fairly. Business continuity plans have been around for a long time and firms do get it. Um, but it's not only about uh, how to come back uh, from, from a disaster, but it's, it's also about uh, how does that impact your recovery, your wind down, if the business continuity plan does not work and you will not recover or you decide not to recover, how does that affect your financial stability? and whether that would uh, link with the recovery plan. And again, what the impact uh, on the client is. So do your communication plans consider that? So it's absolutely critical that you do have that in consideration. And then also ensure that all of this goes into your ICAP. And even if you haven't done anything or you're planning to do, do make sure that you add it to your ICAP. Did you explain that you're evolving? And uh, it is okay not to have everything done, but it's what's important is that there's a, an action plan and that it's getting traction. And this same uh, statement goes to ESG risks. Uh, firms are now required to have to implement their plan after following the the letter sent to firms in two thousand and nineteen. Uh, we there is. Uh, we see quite a lot of tendency to smaller firms to think, what well, oh, we look at our asset classes and to our, uh, uh, for those who do lending, to our lending portfolio, and we don't, we don't think, really think that uh, we're exposed to it. The issue with ESG is that we're not only talking about physical risks, we're also talking about liability risks and transition risks. And not only the impact on the firm, but also on the stakeholders, on the supply chains, uh, on uh, your clients, and any material stakeholders really, it's going to affect everyone. And even if it doesn't affect you directly or any of your clients, what it can affect is, for example, your collateral. And it can also affect you from a macroeconomic point of view. So in the ICAP, it will always feed or it will always be uh, an issue if it affects your macroeconomic conditions because that will be considered in the uh, stress testing for Pillar 2B. So it is crucial that if you haven't done much about ESG, you start doing it and that you document your progress in the ICAP. Um, even if the assessment is, un is undergoing. It is important that you do that uh, workshop with the business that you will sit down and look at every single angle. Uh, we have provided you with a tool for that if you uh, wish to see our latest uh, seminar uh, to help you with that. But please do make sure that you include that uh, in your write as well. Next slide, please. So this is my last slide. Um, how to integrate new risks. Uh, well, once you do have, um, how is it that we manage risks? Well, first of all, we think what is uh, critical for our, our corporate objectives, what is it that we want to do in the next three to five years? And what are the 
possible threats to that, but also the possible possible uh, opportunities, because obviously risk is not only the bad side, it's also the good side of it. So how do you integrate any new risk? Uh, it's no different from all the risks you've got already in place. You need to understand the risk, first of all. Uh, how will you identify, assess, manage, report, mitigate, or accept any new risks? Should therefore follow the same approach as you have for in your risk management framework or in enterprise risk management framework. The issue, obviously, as I said, is to understand the idiosyncrasies of those risks. So, how can you affect your 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 values and your strategic objectives is a key thing. Then that will inform how many policies, procedures, and what's the complexity of the framework you need to have in place. If the risk is really relevant for you, then you need to have a better, a bigger framework. So if not, then maybe not, but document all that as well. And if it's a new risk for you, also you have to add it to the emerging risk section in, in the ICAP. But then obviously, as I said, also linked to the first one, we do identify the risks, which is I've kind of alluded to already. And is, is it a possibility that may affect your franchise, your reputation? your business plan, your clients, your staff, your stakeholders, um, and uh, the decision of identifying a risk as non material should be uh, documented in the ORI cap. You can say we have assessed and for this reason, we discarded it. Uh, and then document again. I said it again, I said it before, I say again, uh, documentation is as critical as the actual calculations. So do make sure that um, you document that in your ICAP. Um, now, I, we, we will have some time to come with some questions. That was all I had uh, in terms of uh, presentation. Thank you so much. Well, thank, thank you, Laura. Um, um, yeah, so we have, uh, thank you everyone for submitting questions. Um, uh, we have received quite a few questions. So I thought I could spend the last few minutes uh, just going through um, a couple of those. So the first one, which I'll probably know the answer to is, obviously today's session uh, uh, has, you know, made reference to quite a lot of PRA documentation and EBA documentation, so very, very much sort of banks focus. Um, and how do you see uh, for investment firms, you know, how applicable are these, these, these rules to um, investment firms, given that the, um, the sort of FCA's guidance uh, in in the kind of pillar two space is very limited. If you look at, for example, a, a document like IFPRI. Um, so I, I think I could just give some insight into that. So yeah, it's absolutely right. If you kind of if you compare the PRA, so the banking regulator with the uh, uh, sort of investment firm regulator, which is the FCA, there's much less. Uh, on the um, FCA side, and um, and uh, so there's more, I guess, uh, room for interpretation for investment firms. Uh, we see, however, quite a few investment firms are using, for example, in their ICAP, they they are using a similar um, sort of methodology to what uh, banks are using, for example, for operational risk. We see, you know, firms using scenario analysis, etc. So similar to what um, you know what firms are doing. Uh, 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 but it's, you know, the, the FCA has a much less prescribed approach to, um, you know, identifying and assessing these risks. So there's more scope for, for, um, for, um, for uh, uh, interpretation. Uh, we also see, I guess, a less focus from the FCA from a prudential spec, you know, in a spectrum on, on the uh, non-financial risk comparing to banks as well. So I guess the banks have more, you know, regulatory interaction with these particular risks than, than some of the smaller investment firms that perhaps only have a, a SREP review every uh, four year or so. Uh, so that's just a bit of context and background on that specific question. Um, I um, also have another question, uh, 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 you know, which comes up on the screen. So this is, do you have any tips for meeting evidencing the one in thousand requirements without sophisticating modeling or empirical data? So I guess this is probably relevant to, you know, uh, perhaps smaller banks and, and, and sort of medium sized investment firms. Dora, do you have any thoughts on that? Yes, uh, that's one of the most uh, asked questions. So uh, the way that our clients 
approach the way the clients approach to meet the one in 1000 they will use combined scenarios so scenarios that they consider independent that would happen all within the next 12 months and overall uh, they will meet that threshold by saying well it's really unlikely that they were to happen independently at the same time within the next 12 months and therefore this is so they, they will assess probability of one assess the probability of the other and the combined probability is one in 1000 or, or above that so there's nothing else to it really well that, well thank you um one other question we have coming up here uh, is around uh, uh for startup banks and i guess startup firms that don't really have any data any historical data uh, so they want to understand uh you know how can you you know what process can be used for uh, identifying and assessing the non-financial element or pillar two pillar two yeah, yeah um, so half of our clients of my clients are startup banks that have not yet uh are not yet operating so it's something that we're quite comfortable with so the obviously if you don't have c1 c2 ability you have c3 ability so you'll, you'll have the way uh, the framework operates is events will look at the past, uh, RCSAs will look at the present, and uh, scenarios are meant to look at the future. So even if you don't have data, what you do have, or you should have, is subject matter expertise. And you will have, obviously, uh, experience of looking at what happens outside um, and what has been happening to banks in the same situation. And what is it that are the key risks that uh, can affect you and then do a scenario on that so it, that you don't necessarily need data or experience but you need to uh, do a bit of market research as to for example if you have uh, legal costs how much would be uh, what how, how much would you pay and you break down the costs you need to document how you got to you assess the impact it's exactly the same way as for banks that have not been around for a long time and don't but if they have been around for a long time, but don't have sufficient data, you, you do scenario analysis and you use subject matter expertise and you document that. And normally that is, for the, for the PRA is okay with that. Thank you. Um, and I guess um, there's another question here coming up, which I think is very interesting. So this is around uh, from a sort of quantification perspective, uh, based on your experience, both looking at, I guess, banks and investment firms, uh, which non-financial risk do you think has the highest uh, uh, sort of capital add-on or impact for firms? So I think actually I can probably answer that my, myself. Um, and I think it's a really good question because it depends you know, very much on what your business model is. But I, I've seen uh, 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 both for investment firms and for, uh, you know, for banks that the kind of operational risk element, if you like, is the major add-on for both banks and investment firms from a from a, a, a you know sort of a pillar two perspective. So this comes back to you know firms with with particularly smaller firms that don't necessarily you know has you know huge amounts of income, for example, uh, where you know there, there there will be a big add-on to uh, you know for operational risk from a pillar two perspective. So almost disproportionate uh, in the sense that it could be 10, 20% add-on on top of the pillar one requirements. Just just one of the, I guess that's probably the main risk that um, that uh, sort of stands out. I think what's probably very interesting with, with non-financial risks going forward is I think ESG is probably a risk where we will uh, start to see add-ons in the future. Probably not now because I don't think the framework is there yet and the regulator hasn't really decided. But I, you can see there are provisions in both, uh, you know, um, you know, the new CRD, so CRD five, uh, and also in the new investment firm directive, so the the the, the IFPR uh, in the UK or IFR in the EU has provisions for. Uh, for uh, uh, for um, a pillar two uh, sort of regulator add-ons for ESG. So I think that's probably something that we will see that the regulators will use as a tool um, 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 in the um, um, in the uh, future. And I think that just leads us on to our, our sort of our final question. And uh, uh, so someone has raised a really good question. So this is around ESG, which is obviously 
very, very hot at the moment. Uh, uh, and do you have any examples of how ESG can be incorporated into a firm's stress test? What kind of stress test, for example, with a you know with a bank or a or a or an asset manager? Uh, 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 used to um, incorporate ESG into the stress test. I'm not sure, Dora, if you have any insights into that. Yeah, so uh, initially what we've seen right now, at least in well, the recent ICAPs, is uh, while firms are not really able to say how it will affect them, uh, they will include it in their uh, pillar 2B, so in the stress testing, in the macroeconomic uh, elements, they will include an element of what if the carbon uh, does not, what if it doesn't go the, the different paths to different carbon uh, reduction in the economy? How does that affect the macroeconomic conditions and therefore how does that affect the firms? But we, we, what we also could do is look at how the physical risks uh, can affect firms. So for example, firms that have uh, uh, mortgages will do a lot of uh, uh, what is the, the probability of the fault uh, or the, the loss given default changes? Uh, how would that impacts my, my portfolio? And that's the kind of things that we have seen so far. But look at transition risks and make sure that all those transition risks are also assessed. And also on physical risks, how, and also, for example, um, how your suppliers can be affected uh, as well. So I think that th those are the key elements for now. As you say, the, the framework is maturing. And there isn't really an understanding yet as to are you going to say that it's a non-financial risk? Are we going to say it's a principal risk? Well, uh, it doesn't really matter how you how you will uh, uh, assess it. How how will you treat it under your uh, taxonomy or your framework? But what's important is that your ICAP starts to reflect the progress there and explains if you haven't tested it now that you're going to test it in the future. But again, macroeconomic conditions are being affected, how the changes to two degrees centigrade um, faster or slower. Uh, but we will see a little bit more once the PRI publishes the result of the biennial uh, scenario as well. Yeah, excellent. And I think that actually leads us on to a final question that just popped in. So um, there's a question here that talks about, you know, uh, a firm that's currently incorporating global warming, weather patterns, and coastal erosion within our mortgage book. How can we assess other areas of risk to the book outside, um, uh, uh, you know, the uh, mortgage book? So I'm so not sure do, if you have any 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 thoughts on that. Yeah, so we do have a tool that we developed uh, for our ESG seminar. Uh, we can send that over, and that will give you some tips on how to do it as well. Excellent. Uh, so I would do that as well. And uh, we, if you do have interest, please, by all means, do look at our uh, seminar. It was really uh, well. It, it was we had quite a few pe people attending, and please do look because we do have quite a lot of uh, tips on global warming, ESG, and whether you call it social risk or you call it governance risk or you call it the three things. It doesn't matter. There's a lot of things and a lot of tips on how to assess it. Yeah. No, 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 that's great. And I think just to, to sort of, you know, to, you know, to summarise um, on, 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 on the, you know, the question of ESG and, and stress setting, I think it's just really important for firms to, you know, go through their book, go through their clients, go through their exposure, even if you're a bank or an asset manager, and just see, you know, do you, are you exposed to any specific sectors where, you know, there's a higher risk from an ESG perspective, for example, if you're exposed, exposed to you know, commodities or mining or energy um, and, and, and just factoring, you know, what is actually from a macroeconomic perspective going to happen, uh, uh, you know, with those industries or perhaps if you are exposed very heavily to, you know, some certain type of manufacturing, for example, where perhaps that business is declining because it's replaced with something else more perhaps environmental friendly. So I think it's really uh, looking at this from two perspectives. One is the kind of macro perspective where you look at kind of the global trends and you know where the um, uh, uh, sort of industry is going, uh, and then secondly, looking more like uh, uh, from a, from an idiosyncratic perspective, perhaps individually you as a firm are you exposed to certain risks that's you know unique to your portfolio because you focus on that on a 
on a, a, a certain area like like energy or mining, for example, which is obviously higher risk from a from a um, uh, uh, um, from a, uh, a sort of ESG perspective. So I think I'm probably going to um, you know leave it all there, uh, given uh, 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 I think we have some really really good questions uh, as we come to the end of our webinar, and I just wanted to share some final thoughts. So. I know we haven't answered everyone's question, but we commit to do so directly with you uh, uh, during uh, uh, sort of after this uh, this web webinar. So thank you very much for submitting your questions. Uh, and um, also, as mentioned earlier, this session has been recorded, so we will send you a copy of of the slides and a link to the recording uh, of the next coming days. Uh, Dora will also send us a link to our uh, recent ESG seminar that we held a fortnight or so ago. I think there'll be some answers to some of the questions here. And then finally, I want to give a, a, a sort of huge thanks to Dora uh, for presenting today. And also thank you very much to all of you for joining. I think we've been more than 120 people on the line today, which is fantastic. So I just want to say thank you very much and I wish you all a safe and good rest of your day. Um, thank you very much. Thank you.